Uh, my name is Adam Taylor. I'm a senior chemistry student here at Grand Valley. What I'm going to be talking about today is using supercritical fluids to perform solventless analytical scale extractions. This is a green chemistry technique. What we're really trying to do here is to reduce our use of organic solvents in the lab. Okay, so what I'm going to start out talking about is I'm going to give you some principles of green chemistry, what it is, how it applies to the things we do. Um, I'll go over some of the common extraction techniques, what we use today, the industry standards. Um, I'll give an introduction to supercritical fluids. For those of you, when I say supercritical fluids, don't really know what I'm talking about, I'll clue you in on that. Um, and then I'll talk about how to perform a supercritical fluid extraction using CO2, and this is a green solvent. I'll get into a little bit more detail about that in the future. And then I'll talk about some of the applications um, for using supercritical CO2 as a green solvent. Okay, so what is green chemistry? Green chemistry, it's important to note that it's not just a subcategory. It's not analytical versus organic versus physical chemistry. It really does apply to all disciplines of chemistry. What you're trying to do is you can still work your chemistry, but you just want to leave a very small carbon footprint, you want to reduce your solvent usage, you just want to have the smallest environmental impact as possible when doing research. And when people think of green chemistry, they think, oh, it's just like a, a hippie movement, but for businesses, this really does play a factor because you can cut operating costs when you reduce lab waste. Okay, so the ACS, the American Chemical Society, has 12 principles for green chemistry. I've put stars next to the five that are the most prevalent for using supercritical fluids. Um, the first of which is prevention. What they're talking about is rather than having a ton of solvent usage and then having to clean it up, you just prevent how much you use in the first place. That's the number one category. Um, they also talk about atom economy. You want to use, don't create a bunch of extra reagents, extra products, just try to find the most concise synthesis possible. Um, some of the other ones, designing safer chemicals, you don't want products that have really volatile, um, really toxic chemicals. But the main thing with supercritical fluids and CO2 is it is a safe solvent and auxiliary, and it's designed for energy efficiency and its use of renewable feedstocks. It has CO2 is very abundant. It's something that we have plenty of, so that's really important. Um, also down here, CO2 is very inert, so it fits in the category 12 here, the inherently safer chemistry um, and accident prevention. Okay, so what do we want from an ideal green extraction? We want to be able to take our soil samples, something in a matrix, we want to be able to purify that and extract our analytes for us to run our analysis. So we want it to be easy, we want it to be cheap, we want it to be fast, we want to have a good yield, but most importantly, we want to use the least amount of reagents possible. We don't want lots of waste, we don't want anything having to go out to a chemical disposal company. We just want to keep everything in-house. We want it, ideally, be able to just flush everything down the drain and not have to worry about it. Okay, so what are the industry standards? What people typically use today, um, this is called a Soxlet extraction. As you can see, you pack a thimble with your solid matrix, and then what you do is down here, switch to this side, you can see this orange, this is your organic solvent, and what you do is you heat it up, it comes up here, it condenses back down and it rinses through. Now, it works very well, it's very reliable and you get, very, you get high extraction yields. It is time consuming, but what, what is important to note is all of this orange represents organic solvents, such as hexane or methylene chloride. So in order to run this, um, typically Sigma Aldrich sells them, their most common is a 250 milliliter. So you're using 250 milliliters of solvent in this system per extraction. So using these two, you're going to generate a lot of waste. Yeah. 
Okay, so what's the other kind of extraction that we can use? The other kind is a solid phase extraction. It uses a syringe with a um, disc. It replaces the silica gel columns. Um, they're simple to run. They have a high extraction yield. However, the cartridges, um, they're not reusable, so they are disposable, so you do generate a lot of waste through that. Um, you'll see these are the different steps that you do in a solid phase extraction. In each of these steps, you could use up to 10 milliliters to condition, to load, to wash. These solvents would again be like acetone, hexane, methylene chloride, basically any organic reagent, depending on what you're trying to analyze. You could use 10 milliliters each time. So what that ends up being is up to 50 milliliters per sample if you're really rinsing it through, trying to get a high extraction. And did a little bit of math, and if you run 50 samples, you could fill up a two and a half liter jug of organic waste. And these don't take that long to run. It would take you about a half an hour to fill that up. Okay, so now that we've seen how things have worked in the past, we can look into the future. So the future really is supercritical fluids, supercritical CO2 as a green solvent. So how do we get to supercritical CO2 and what exactly is it? This is a phase diagram. Some people who have taken chemistry before, this probably looks familiar. For those of you that haven't, I'll describe it a little bit. Say you had a block of ice. This would be a block of ice. It would be solid at, say, the atmospheric pressure. And then as you temperatures down here, as you heat it up, it would turn into a liquid. As you heat it up, it would boil. Well, what happens is if you heat something up to a, a high temperature and you put it under a lot of pressure, you get up into this area, which is called the supercritical fluid area. Okay, now what I have here is a quick video of what a, it is sulfur hexafluoride going supercritical. And before I actually start it, I'll talk about it a little bit. When we start the video, we're going to see a meniscus. You'll see a water level. And so we know that we're starting here in the liquid phase. And what, what's going to happen is in this pressure cell, they're going to increase the temperature. You'll see it start to boil a little bit. And then what you'll see is you'll see that water level, that meniscus, disappear. And we will be in this supercritical region. And then after a few seconds, they'll release the pressure. And you'll see it turn into a vapor and then slowly become just a little bit more liquid-like. OK, so what's happening here? We are in our liquid phase. And if we watch it, we're increasing the temperature. We can start to see some bubbling, some boiling. So we're moving across here towards the supercritical re region. And what we see is our water line just disappears. And it is at this point that we are a supercritical fluid. And what's going to happen is we're going to release the pressure, and it will turn into a vapor. It's called, sometimes called a cloud point. And then it will once again turn back into a liquid. OK, just a quick little bit of trivia. Um, that disappearing water line is really characteristic of a supercritical fluid. How they were discovered was you had this Charles Cagniard de la Tour, this French chemist. He took a cannon, and he had a flint ball in it. And he rotated the cannon, and he heated it. And when the water inside went supercritical fluid, he lost that meniscus, that water level, so we no longer heard a splashing sound as it would go in the water, out the water. He was able to estimate the critical temperature to be 362 degrees. And we know today that the critical temperature of water is actually 374. So he was actually pretty close. So what's happening on this molecular level? We see the meniscus disappear. We see it go from a liquid to this gas-like phase. So what we have is we have this really supercritical fluid is really this in-between state. It's kind of a half liquid, half gas. But what makes it really unique and what makes it ideal for a 
as a green solvent, and any kind of solvent, is that it has the properties of both. You, get, you really get the best of both worlds when talking about a solvent and a supercritical fluid. Here's a table of just a few characteristics of gases, solids, liquids, and we see supercritical fluids. The most important thing to note on this table is that a supercritical fluid does have a high diffusivity, so it's able to spread. You put it in a low container, it will spread, much like a gas will. But it also has this density. You see these fixed numbers. With a supercritical fluid, you have a variable density, something you can change. And that plays into the solvent strength and the extraction. And I'll talk about that in this next slide here. So how do you change the the pressure, or how do you change the density of a supercritical fluid? And that's, you just change the pressure. As you increase the pressure of a supercritical fluid, you make it more liquid-like, you would increase the solvent strength. As you decrease the pressure, you'd make it more gas-like. So as a green solvent, what this allows you to do is it allows you to use CO2 for a wider range of topics. If you need a stronger solvent, you can increase the pressure making it more dense and you can get a stronger solvent rather than having to go from hexane to isooctane or having to go from water to methanol. If you want to change your solvent strength, it's just all you have to do is modify the pressure. And as you increase the density, you increase the solvent strength because you're becoming more liquid-like. Okay, so why supercritical CO2? What's so special about it? Well, one of the first things to note is critical temperature is only 31 centigrade, which is easily obtainable, and the critical pressure is 74 bar, which is, once again, easily obtainable. Now, one of the important things to note for the principles of green chemistry was they were talking about using inert chemicals in the laboratory, and CO2 is very, very inert. It's non-toxic. You can you're breathing in right now as you, I'm breathing it in, breathing it out. And that's really something that a lot of these other chemicals, these solvents that we typically use in the lab, they really can't say that. Um, things like toluene, chloroform, <laughs> pretty sure you don't, you wouldn't want to breathe those in much like you would CO2. Okay, so now, now that we've kind of learned why CO2 how do we use it to our advantage? This is a simple diagram of a supercritical fluid extraction. What we'll have is we have a liquid CO2 tank, and we start with liquid CO2. We'll use a cooler just to make sure it stays in its liquid form, and then we pump it into this large oven vessel, and then right here we have a preheater coil, and as we heat this up, we have the, we reach critical pressure right here with the pump, and at this preheater coil, we reach critical temperature. So at this stage, we have our supercritical fluid. And what you do is you place your matrix or whatever you're trying to extract from in this extraction cell, and you flow your supercritical through it, fluid through it, and it will extract whatever analyte you are attempting to. There are two different kinds. You can run a dynamic extraction, which is where you have this valve closed, or sorry, a static extraction where you have this valve closed and you just run your CO2, your supercritical CO2 into your extraction vessel, really let it penetrate your matrix. And then what you can do is you can open your valve and you can run what's called a dynamic extraction, which is where you let this, you let your supercritical CO2 flow through it. And then at this metering valve, there's, it's two valves actually, talk about that in a second, but you, you collect your sample and then you just, you release the pressure and it allows your CO2 to just dissipate and you're left with just your analyte. That's something that a lot of um, other extractions, especially the Soxyl extraction, when you, after you do your extraction, you run that, that boiling and condensing process you extract your analytes, but you still have that 250 milliliters of solvent or however much you use that you still have to get rid of before analysis. However, this system, it allows the CO2 to be 
at room temperature, once you lower that below its critical pressure, it just becomes its gas phase. And some people, they can actually take that CO2 and they capture it and they just put it in a pump and they recycle it. So you can even have a closed CO2 system. If people are concerned about, oh, if everyone uses supercritical CO2, we're just going to add more CO2 to the atmosphere. Well, that's not true. You can close the system, you can recycle your CO2. And there's been studies where people are trying to just use um, carbon capture from the atmosphere and try to purify it for a system like this. So these, I'll talk about the valves really quick. You have the two valve system, the one for the dynamic. This one controls large pressure changes. That would be your dynamic or static extraction. And then it's this valve right here that allows you to collect your sample. Here's a more in-depth drawing of it. What you'll have is you'll have your analyte and your supercritical fluid come in off of the, after the, off the extraction cell. They'll come in here and they'll come into this. It's called a trap. And then up here you have an extra line and you'll flush just a little bit of solvent through this trap to collect your analyte. And this is a diagram of the trap you'll have your analyte and supercritical fluid come in here as you just rinse them from your trap. And then these valves right here allow the CO2 to just dissipate off and you're left with your analyte in the small amount of solvent. It's usually about one or two milliliters of solvent, but people have found different ways to capture this without even using the one or two milliliters. So you really can do a solventless extraction. Here's a more in-depth diagram. Once again, we see the CO2. We see the pumps. It goes super critical. You pump it through. We have the two valve system. We have the collection. And then right here, they started to diagram the makings of being able to recycle the CO2. Okay. So what do we want to do? What are the possibilities with the supercritical fluid? Um, one of the possibilities is textile dyeing. What you actually do is you have, you have your fabric. You place your fabric in here. You have a dye vessel. And you have your supercritical, your supercritical CO2. And you pump your supercritical fluid up through the dye into your extraction vessel where you would have your fabric. Now, it seems kind of counterintuitive because this entire slideshow we've been talking about using supercritical CO2 to extract things from a matrix, and now we're actually impregnating the dye molecules into the fabric. But what happens is you, the supercritical CO2 picks up the dye molecules, it takes them into the fabric, and when you release the pressure, the CO2 turns to a gas, and all that's left is the dye molecules. And it leaves those dye molecules in the fabric. And you have a recirculating pump, and you just pump this through until you use up all of the dye that you have. And you can dye any fabric that you want in this vessel. Um, when the manufacturers talked about doing this, they said they had a 99% dye take up. So they only had 1% of waste from the original amount of dye, which is very, very good for fabrics. Normally, you just have clothing. You put it in a big vat. You pour some dye in. You stir it up, and you just let it soak in, and you have a large amount of waste. This, it's like 99% efficient. And you can, any supercritical fluid that does pass through with some of the dye, they were able to collect again, and that also led to the high percentage. OK, so what are some of the other applications of supercritical CO2? Um, one of the other ones that is really on the forefront is using supercritical CO2 as a dry for dry cleaning. The most common use, the most common chemical in use today is called PERC for short, but it's tetrachloroethylene. Um, it is assumed to cause leukemia. It is banned um, for retail sale, it can't 
appear in any retail products and it's due to be its use is due to be phased out by 2015 I believe so there's really a big push to try to find alternatives to this it does work very well but it is a chlorinated hydrocarbon so it does have a lot of negative health effects and the CO2 it's the opposite of the dye impregnation you're able to put the fabric in there run the supercritical CO2 through it and try to extract some of the stains and since you can alter the density of the supercritical fluid you can change the solvent strength so you're not pulling all of the dyes out of the material and you're only pulling out those loose stains one of the other applications is to clean medical implants when you have a like a hip a titanium hip or a plate or a rod in your leg these are very strong alloys and when they cut them they use lathes and they use a lot of oil to not burn up their drill bits anything like that and what can happen is those cutting oils they get burned into the metal they get really cooked on there so they're cooked on there it's like scrubbing a pan that has just been burnt on you can't just scrub it off so what the supercritical CO2 allows you to allows you to do is you can put your medical implant in the extraction vessel you can run the CO2 the supercritical CO2 over it and it's able to pull out all of those cutting oils off the surface of the metal and then when you release the pressure the CO2 just becomes a gas and you're left with a clean metal implant because what they traditionally try to do now is they'll try to they'll just rinse it with a different solvent and it doesn't really lead to a solution you just there's always going to be a residue whereas if you use the supercritical CO2 you're left with no residue it's a gas at room temperature which is one of the main reasons why it's used for a lot of these things one of the other applications I found was it's used for timber treatment a lot of lumber a lot of wood is pressure treated or it's treated with chemicals to prevent it from rot if you build a deck or something you have definitely experienced this when buying a lot of lumber what the supercritical CO2 allows you to do is it allows you to get those chemicals deeper into the wood so you actually have to use less of them because you're able to have more of the wood have access to those chemicals to protect it so you don't just have to put a log in a big vat of chemicals and just let them soak in you're able to put a two by four in a vessel and then run supercritical CO2 and it's able to really get into the fibers of the wood um, the main usage of supercritical CO2 is the decaffeination of coffee and tea you put your coffee beans in an extraction vessel you run supercritical CO2 through it and it's able to pull out just the caffeine and what you're left with is the whole bean that's really unmodified but the most important thing is since you're consuming this this is a food you really don't want any residues from any solvents um, the two most common extraction solvents are methylene chloride DCM and ethyl acetate um, if you look up methylene chloride the Occupational Safety Administration for the United States lists it as a possible workplace carcinogen and it's a workplace carcinogen because it's something that they find it's a carcinogen if you have daily access to it if you're exposed to it on a daily basis well I know a lot of people that drink coffee and tea multiple times a day so if you have any of these residues you could be faced with this but with the supercritical CO2 you don't have these residues you're able to extract drop the pressure and it just turns to gas and it's gone okay so in conclusion green chemistry is really spelled CO2 that's really the future of using a solventless extraction and reducing organic waste and this is profitable for everybody everybody really wins with supercritical CO2 businesses they can have faster extractions they can reuse a lot of their solvents it will help them cut costs and then 
everyday consumer gets benefits from this because they get cleaner food products. They get coffee and tea without organic, organic residues in them. And everybody likes a clean environment. So I'd like to acknowledge um, Dr. Chi, my faculty advisor, Dr. Kovacs, who's also helping out with this green chemistry, um, all of the GVSU faculty that have taught me through the years, and especially the GVSU Center for Scholarly and Creative Excellence for giving me this opportunity to talk. Thank you.